Welcome back to the No Referees Podcast. I'm your host, Everest Akajobi, bringing you another quarantine edition of our show. As always, you can find us on our social media pages at No Referees Pod and on our new YouTube channel, No Referees Podcast. We're joined by a very, very special guest today, the founder of the Rugby Corner. He is a USA rugby captain who captained his team to gold medal in sevens and a bronze medal in 15s. He's a current USA rugby broadcaster, and he has his signature one-liners all over the world. You can follow him on his social media pages at the Rugby Corner. The man that tells you to keep the change, our friend Dallin Stanford. How you doing, my brother? Everest, yeah, thanks so much for having me on the show, my friend. Uh, delighted to be here. Yeah, thanks, man. You know, rugby is, is an is, is interesting sport. You know, it's an international sport. But for us in America, you know, we really don't know too much about it. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to get into a lot of rugby stuff, a lot of stuff for uh, international uh, what the perception of the rest of the world is about rugby. But I'm going to get into some fun stuff initially. You know, as, as a young guy growing up in Cape Town, you know, uh, you know, I asked all my, uh, my guests, you know, what was their first experience with a referee, being good or being bad? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, growing up in South Africa, I would say we were always taught uh, at high school and at a younger level to respect the officials. And so that's something that always stood with me. And I suppose while it's frustrating in any games when things don't go your way or you feel like the call is incorrect, the main thing uh, some of my young mentors and coaches always told me was that how many times have you ever changed the referee's decision or mind? And there have been no times, right? So, so since that as a young kid, it's, it's always been whatever the decision is, that's the decision, and you go back and focus on the next play. So uh, fortunately, I can say I've never been, you know, carded. I've never been, I've never spoken to by the referee because, you know, it's that respect you have for the official because let's be fair, none of us want to be in the middle deciding who gets the ball or, or what goes on. That's something we'll leave, leave to them, you know? Well, I find that hard to believe. Rugby so intense, you know, it's, it's, it's such a physical game and it's not a high emotions, you know, to, to say you've never been carded. You know, well, if, if you, okay, you never had an interaction with a referee. Tell me somebody that you saw that's had an interaction referee like a player, a teammate, or a coach that you was like, dang, that's over the top. Well, well, I will say, you bring up a good point there. So soccer, for example, you do watch on television and you see the, the, uh, the players run up to the referee and they're in their faces and they're shouting and arguing and stuff like that. So I think that's the real uniqueness about rugby is that it's completely different. If you don't have respect for the, the officials in our sport, the culture you don't belong there you know what i mean and so it's like here's a game of respect while it's heated you do you fly to your position you've taken people's heads off you're, you're trying to hit the opposition as hard as you can but you know that the one person that is safe is the official um and and you know so you know i've had some teammates that have definitely argued at officials um and some have been sent from the field because of just simply talking talking back to the official um whether they use foul language or not i think it's an ethos of the game right is that respect element and i, and I know it's it's it doesn't you know, other sports might not believe it, but it is true. It, it, it's that part of the game. Because sometimes you'll have these six foot seven, huge rugby players, you know, 300 pounds in size, and they will look down to the referee who's five foot and say, I'm sorry, sir, or I'm sorry, ma'am. And back and backpedal the 10 meters after they get their marching orders. So uh, it really is true. I, unfortunately, don't have any official stories. I've got stories of players getting hurt or tackled or hit, but uh, that's for a different time, maybe. <laughs> cool, cool. Let's switch gears real quick to the current times. You know, we're in, in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, you're a guy that is born and raised in uh, South Africa. I'm sure you have a lot of family and friends, uh, not only in South Africa, but all, all over the world. Uh, you currently reside in the uh, United States and, and the Boston area. So let's talk about, you know, what you're hearing from your friends and family who's currently in South Africa with the pandemic. How are they social distancing over there uh, and things of that nature? Yeah, so it is obviously a crazy new world we're all living in. Um, and my, my, my mom is in South Africa still currently. My sister li lives in England. But again, you're right. Lots of, lots of friends that are still in Cape Town. The, the tricky, the tricky uh, uh, situation for them was, of course, that lockdown happened. Uh, a lot of people then became unemployed or weren't able to work remotely. Not everybody has the luxury of that. And so that really has a big effect on the economy, a big effect on people. I think my biggest concern, of course, is for for people that were living from paycheck to paycheck. And it doesn't just have to be South Africa. In many countries around the world, now all of a sudden you're told you can't work. And then sometimes the government's slow in, in, in getting them some necessary funds. So that really is a tricky situation. One thing which was pretty, pretty interesting to hear was that in South Africa, they could order food and you can go pick it up at the 
the store or you could get it dropped off online. But for some reason, you couldn't get alcohol. So you couldn't get any beers or any alcohol. And I thought that was kind of crazy. Like South Africa, we love having a little drink, you know. Um, and if you're missing your sports, then at least you have that, right? So uh, that was something I think they've only recently opened that up. So, so friends are a lot more delighted right now with how things are going. Um, but speaking about the, you know, the, the work-wise, you know, my career, a lot, a lot of it is based on going to big sporting events. You know, we have thousands of people there present and broadcasting. So, you know, you know, lots of people have been affected in all different industries, but you know, ours, ours for sure. The nice thing is that there are opportunities where you can do stuff online, you know, podcasts, um, or maybe even uh, uh, rebroadcasting old matches, and you can still commentate on things on the, on that nature, you know. Um, but it's definitely it's changed things tremendously. Oh, you trying to tell me your family and friends can't get another that Castle beer, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know it. Well done, <laughs> exactly. O only available from this week on, you know. So they've been struggling. <laughs> well, that's, that's well, look. I just want to say, uh, uh, you know. Prayers to your family and friends overseas uh, in your hometown, uh, South Africa, uh, your sister in England. Um, anybody who listens to my podcast and knows me, my father's from Nigeria, so I have a lot of family and friends um, in Nigeria. Uh, so we just wanted, you know, just to give your, your family and friends a shout out, you know, say we're thinking of them, we love them, and uh, thanks for the, the, the messaging. Let's take it back to when uh, Dallin was a young pup. You know, you know, how did you get started in rugby? Uh, you know, what is it? Was it – you know, uh, soccer, was it rugby, was it cricket, was it, you know, tennis, you know, kind of tell me how that re evolution started for you back in the day. Well, Everest, I will say, you know your sports really well, because often when I talk about cricket, a lot of my American friends are just like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> and man, that's, because, that's because my father's from Nigeria, man, so, you know. <laughs> exactly, you know it well. Yeah, so growing up in South Africa, the, the beautiful thing was, it's a very outdoor nation, there's a lot of sports on the go, and so uh, even though, like, for example, I wasn't a strong swimmer. I played water polo, you know. I did a lot of track and field events. Um, this, the winter sports, the main winter sport there was rugby for us. Uh, uh, soccer was available as well. Um, but I was better with, the, you know, the rugby ball in the hands than dribbling with my feet, you know. Uh, definitely in summer, we played cricket and a few other sports. Um, but I think as a culture, it's very sport mad and sport crazy. And I, I, I'm a big fan of not specializing in one sport. Try everything. See what you like. See what you enjoy. For me, the main thing was, you know, the friends that came with it, the camaraderie and the, and the friendships. And particularly in South Africa, growing up just after apartheid had ended, it was important to uh, belong to a community of all South Africans. And that, for me, that was getting into sports. And so, you know, having teammates from all walks of life was a real blessing. Uh, and it just showcased South Africa, especially old South Africa, uh, uh, people I had in South Africa before, and how sport can be unifying a uh, 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 global sport and Nelson Mandela was so brilliant during 1995 the Rugby World Cup where he used rugby particularly to bring a nation together uh, and so for me I loved I loved the sport because of you know what it did the game itself was very exciting as well and it gave people opportunities and I think that's the biggest thing that I advocate today is try, try sports try anything you don't have to be a professional but you can still take your whatever sport you play you can take it overseas and that's how I ended up in the USA I just came to play for a season and ended up staying. Yeah, no, I think I heard a story uh, about um, Carlin Isles. I think he had no rugby experience uh, at, at all and just like picked up the phone and called somebody at USA Rugby. I mean, the story is pretty pretty remarkable. It, it, I don't think those type of things just happen in like the NBA or the NFL or Major League Baseball to just you know, say, hey, I'm just going to pick up the game and, you know, be a world, world renowned person. <laughs> Well, well, that's the thing. I mean, his story is remarkable. He saw it on TV. He looked at it and was like, that looks pretty cool. I think I can do that. And he was, now rugby has two forms of the game. There's seven aside, which is still in a big size field, like a football field, but seven people against seven. And then the other version is 15 against 15, a bit more condensed. So Colin saw this, the seven on seven, and he was a sprinter. He's like, I can get around people. And to, to this day, he is the fastest rugby player alive and one of the top point scorers in the seven aside game, uh, a national hero. Um, and his story is amazing. I mean, he, he came from a difficult background and here he is now superstar heading to potentially the second Olympic games. Yeah. We're going to have, we're going to have to uh, get that Carl and Isles connection to, to Mr. Stanford. You know, I need to talk to that brother, but uh, easy, easy. Uh, set you up. we're going to, we're going to talk about overseas and we're going to talk about sports schools because uh, internationally, you know, a lot of kids, that are young age, teenagers, preteens, they get exposed to these sports schools. And, you know, in America, we really don't have that other than the IMG Academy, a couple other small little places here and there. So I just want to talk about as a youth, you know, did you have uh, access to a sports school or, uh, or, or what those kind of things, how they create as we move over to the next phase, uh, moving up in the ranks in rugby? 
Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I, will, I will first say the advantages of growing up in a country like South Africa uh, and, and other places around the world that focus are, have a balanced focus, I will say, your academics and your sporting career. So high school for me, I think, was a real formative time period because you had to do sports. And I know that, you know, some people might be against that, but I think it's, it's important to take part, whether you play uh, just for the fun of it or whether you're serious about the sport. We had to do one summer sport, had to do one winter sport. And the teachers at the school taught the sport as well. So you, you, you knew them really well, which I think was good. When I was working in the Los Angeles um, uh, school system, it was interesting because in the after school time period, some schools had access to sports, some didn't. And those sports were also independent providers coming to the school and not everybody had access to the same sports where we proudly represented our high school. And then after that, when we went to university, we then formed there were sports teams again. So you could take part in any sport you wanted. And so my natural progression, of course, was rugby. And so I didn't have to go to a special academy. I just went to university and played there for, for the team. Um, and through that had many opportunities as well. So there's a natural pathway, you know, um, from a young, young kid. I started when I was eight years old playing rugby all the way through to uh, about 25 years old in South Africa. And I could still be playing there today but obviously my path ended up coming to America you know so I think that's kind of where it's, it's an interesting one where the U.S. particular is slightly different and I think at a big disadvantage because team sports has so many uh, 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 areas that a human can develop and improve their life and uh, it's something that I, I maintain is, a, is, is an element the key element that is missing uh, in a lot of our communities here. Uh, that's actually a question I was going to ask you, you know, uh, in relation to how the USA has a, a disadvantage as far as the, the, the sports that are more internationally coveted, rugby, soccer, cricket, uh, different things of that nature. Why do you think the U.S. Uh, is so in, in a disadvantage because of that? So there's a couple things at play with, uh, I'll call them, uh, you know, more fringe sports, if you will. Because the U.S. sporting landscape is so well set up for the traditional sports, there, there seems to be not a lot of investment or, um, or time and energy put into those sports. And that makes sense, right? Because if you have basketball, football, baseball, all those sports that you know, are multi-million, billion-dollar industries, um, to start up a new sport, you know, it rivals those sports sometimes in the time of year that it's played. And so that's really tough. The, the interesting thing is when I've spoken to a lot of my friends that follow American football, they watch rugby for the first time and they can't believe it. They're like, how is this game legal? And, 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 and me coming from rugby, I'm like, what are you talking about? They go, you're not wearing any pads. You're not wearing any helmets. You're just flying into people. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. They love it. Because it's really cool. And then everybody can pick the ball up and run. And it's not just a special team that comes on. So I know that people will, when they see it, they enjoy it. While they might not understand all the rules and the laws of the game, um, that I think will come in time. So the, the disadvantages are there for sure, but I think the advantages there are also coming through. For example, when the U.S. women's team and men's team does well in, at the uh, Tokyo Olympic Games next year, that will be when American fans sit up and watch and go, wow, this is a real good sport, cool sport. And then hopefully more development will come in that. There is now a professional 15 aside rugby league in America, and that hasn't been the case before. I arrived here in 2003. There was nothing of the sort. Domestic rugby was more of a hobby. Now you can play for a professional team. You can get pl uh, paid to play the sport of rugby. So those young college students coming out and are looking for things to do, you know, perfect for them. And then we've got some overseas professionals coming in and helping the grow the game that way. So there's definitely uh, the, the trajectory is, is on the up, which is nice. Do you feel that, uh, that the trajectory is, is up to where, how you mentioned college players, is, is the USA, USA rugby going to have like a direct pipeline? Like I know I was talking to my friend, um, John Abdul, who's with USA Water Polo. He said they have a, a Olympic development program in place for water polo uh, for their college kids and their young kids, like a direct pipeline. Is that something that will be in place for USA rugby with those, uh, those college kids as well? Yeah, so you, you, a good point about the pipeline. There actually is, for the very first time, happening uh, is the Major League Rugby, which is the professional 15-a-side competition in the U.S. They're having a college draft. So that's the first time it's ever happened. And so, you know, these 24 players from different colleges around the U.S. will get contracted uh, to the 13 professional teams uh, in the States, which is brilliant. I think in terms of the Olympic program, too, the pipeline is a bit more difficult to get into that. Um, but... Once you're recognized in the lower age grade system for the U.S., yes, you're in the talent pool. And then you get your eye is kept on you ahead of the Olympic Games. And I think that the Olympics was big for rugby because in the rest of the world uh, where rugby is popular, the Olympic Games is great. It's an added, an added event, if you will. But here in North America, 
is so much about the Olympics every four years. Um, and those fringe sports that we spoke about really do get exposure. And all you need is a bit more investment in the game. And America, let's be fair, America has all the investment, has all the corporations and entities that could get behind it and has the fan base that can support the game as well in the long term. So those two things will collide hopefully in the next few years. The Simple Pour is a beverage concierge service specializing in creating flavorful crafted punches for all of your events and needs. From their house favorites to the custom creations, they have a beverage that's going to satisfy every taste bud you have. Certified mixologist Kevin Barber literally pours his heart into each beverage. You have the individual 12-ounce bottles, or if you want to step it up to the big boy gallon. Some of the heavy hitters on the menu include to kill your blues with that fresh citrus, fan favorite green goblin and my favorite henny punch no referees podcast and a sip of pour have mixed up a new drink for you enjoy 15 percent off your entire purchase by logging on to the website the simple pour htx.com enter promo code no referees 15 at the time of checkout the simple pour simple name extraordinary taste I want you to keep it real with me. I want you, you know, ain't nobody listening, ain't nobody watching. What's the worst of the world's perception of you on USA Rugby? Are they saying that we trash? Are they saying that we're good? You know, what when the, the, the reigning World Cup uh, champion South Africa, I know that they won, you know, recently. When they step onto the field against USA Rugby, are they like, man, it's a cakewalk? Or are they really taking the USA Rugby serious? So to keep it real with you, several years ago, it would be more of a cakewalk, right? Teams would come against the USA and they might field a developing side, a, a, a second team, if you will. And this is the men's game. I'm not, I'm, I'll talk about the women's game in a second. And that is in the, in the 15-a-side game. Uh, their last World Cup now, where South Africa did win, the US um, you know, played a couple of teams tight for the first, generally how it works, for the first 40 to 60 minutes of an 80-minute game. And then the last 20 minutes, the, the teams you know, that have more funding and more preparation and more players that play the game, simply put, um, you know, put the points on the scoreboard. But I will say that they do take every game absolutely seriously, especially against the USA these days because of the success of the sevens program. And because if you do lose to a team like the USA, that would not look good for the country's record. So Japan, as an example, um, is outside of the top 10 rugby teams ranked in the world. And they beat South Africa in the 2015 Rugby World Cup. And Myself as a American, but also as a South African, I was very proud of Japan doing that because that showed the world as well that you can't take any game, you can't not take any game seriously. And you want teams that are ranked outside of the top 10 to beat teams in the top 10. So that's what you want. You want the excitement of the game. Seven aside, to be honest with you, the US now, in the men and the women, are the, one of the top three sides in the world. And that is exciting. That has absolutely changed in the last decade. Um, when we played, um, we, we, we were on, playing on the, what's called the Sevens World Series. There were 10 stops around the world. We were only invited, Everest, we were only invited to three of those 10 stops because, you know, they deemed the U.S. as a developing rugby nation, which is fine, which is what we were. But because we got better over the years, we got invited to six tournaments and then all 10. And now currently top three in the world, which is remarkable. Uh, last year, the U.S. women and the men finished second in the series. This year, a little bit lower down, but the series unfortunately stopped halfway because of um, so to answer your there in the men's game, yes, the, everyone knows the U.S. is a huge threat in sevens, not so much yet in 15s, but the women's 15 side game, yes, absolute threat, top four in the world as well, uh, a Rugby World Cup champion in 1991, um, and so uh, the women's Eagles are definitely, definitely the, 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 you know, the top ranked out of the 15 sides uh, when it comes to American rugby. So let's talk about uh, sevens aside, 15 aside, you know. A lot of people in America, like you said, you know, American football, um, we'll get to the uh, foundations of American football and how they basically stole all their stuff from rugby, you know, so <laughs> all the names and how they scored and everything. Um, sevens aside, you know, like you said, the USA uh, on the men's and women's, you know, top five in the world, 15 aside, it kind of, when I heard, first did my research about sevens and 15s, First thing I thought of well, in, in American football, they play a uh, seven on seven. Uh, so I thought about that. And then 15, uh, it's like, you know, you got 30 people on the field at one time. I was like, damn, I, you know, NFL, uh, American football, you got 22. Like, damn, that's too many, a lot of itself. 
So let's talk about, you know, the difference in not only the, the sevens and the 15th game, but the speed in the uh, uh, sevens and the 15th game. Yeah, so seven aside, it actually was started way after the 15 aside game was invented for a summer sport to keep fit. So people were like, we don't have enough players to play 15 against 15. Let's just throw the ball around. We'll keep the field the same size, um, but it'll be good fitness and exercise. And that really has developed into an Olympic sport, um, which was played in 1920 and 1924. And now it's back in, in 2016 and now 2021. So the great thing about seven aside is that you don't have to necessarily be a brilliant rugby player to, to excel at sevens. And that's why countries like the USA, um, Canada, you know, other countries that are non-traditional rugby playing nations, if you will, can excel at the seven aside game. You need to be fast. You need to be strong, uh, but you need to be fit as well because it's seven minutes, then a half time for two minutes and then seven minutes again. So it's a very short game. You need to be able to keep that intensity and keep that speed throughout the whole match. You only have seven players on the field at all times and you have five substitutes that you could use, you can rotate in and out. So that's not a lot. So that means some players will stay on the field maybe the whole time. So it's, it's a really interesting game from that point of view. The excitement level for sevens though, which is really cool, and this is why I love the sport, is that you're playing against other countries from all around the globe so it's not just a regular 15 aside game which brings in a, a new zealand versus the usa and that's one game for 80 minutes this one is 16 countries from around the globe you're playing japan you're playing ireland you're playing you know again the the even kenya are playing nigeria haven't played on this in the series yet but you're playing against all these brilliant nations and countries in short games you play six games in an average weekend um, and then you decide you know as you progress in the quarters semis and finals the brilliant thing about sevens is because it's so short Often the game is decided in the final play. So the final play in rugby, unlike football, when the siren sounds and full time has happened, the referee doesn't blow his or her whistle. It's play on till the ball stops, till it goes dead. And you could keep you can keep playing for five minutes if you keep possession and work your way up field and you could score and, and win. So just because the siren sounds for the final moment of the game, you can still win. And that's the cool thing about seven aside. It makes it so exciting for the fans and for the players. Fifteens, great game as well, very traditional. Uh, 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 the players there on average are a lot bigger uh, because it's the contest various set pieces. One is called the scrum. That's where everybody pushes over the ball. The lineup, when you throw the ball in and people get lifted, um, and that's when the hooker throws the ball in and the hooker hooks it back. Um, and just to avoid any confusion, the, the, the position is called a hooker because in the scrum, they use their, their feet to hook the ball back. And so that's kind of where it comes from. And so 15 aside game is, is definitely very popular around the world. And the World Cup is every four years as well. Uh, New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, and England are the only sides to have won the World Cup for the men's side of it. Um, but that game is a lot more physical, a lot longer. Um, it's not as exciting, you know, for me personally uh, and some fans as, uh, as you would. So if you get any friends watching, start them with sevens and then they can work to 15s. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have my, I think I'm gonna have my seven-year-old son, uh, you know, start with some sevens because he's super fast and he can run. He plays basketball. He's running all over the place. So maybe I have him start with some sevens. <laughs> really? So I want to, so I want to ask you, you know, since we're right there on positions, and we're gonna get to the position in a second because if anybody knows about the positions in rugby, it's almost like walking down the aisle of a, a Home Depot with the different names. <laughs> uh, so let's just talk about the evolution of rugby. It started off in rugby England. Um, the, it was a game that was created, uh, really most people don't probably don't know that Dr. James Naismith, who created the, the game of basketball, uh, had some different plans. You know, he needed to keep his, his athletes fit. Uh, uh, give us a little bit of background of some history of rugby to, and, and to let people know stuff that they might, they might not know. Yeah, so, you know, rugby is very similar to, I mean, obviously American football, but uh, uh, basketball because of the back and forth nature of teams attacking nonstop. And um, the, the, the story goes, though, in 1823 at rugby school in England, they were playing, kids were playing soccer outside. And one player called William Webb Ellis picked up the soccer ball and started to run with it. And everybody was like, what are you doing? They were like, that's kind of cool, though. And so that kind of concept of, you know, instead of, uh, you know, just using your feet to play a sport, to be able to, you can kick as well, but you can use your hands to pass the ball. That's kind of how rugby apparently started uh, in that time period. And um, the, the trophy that is played for in rugby every four years is called the William Webb Ellis Cup. Uh, named after the, the person that invented it. But basketball has a lot of similarities going back and forth between the two sports as well. And then American football, which is interesting, a lot of people don't realize that when you 
when you score in American football, it's called a touchdown, but you don't yeah. have to put the ball down, and which in, is interesting. And, and rugby is what it's called when you make a score a try. That's right. You have to touch the ball onto the ground, exactly. hence the word touchdown. Exactly. So there's so many similarities, you know, in, in both sports. Um, and, and one thing when I, you know, used to work a lot in youth development with young kids, their parents would ask me if rugby is dangerous and, and what about concussion? And because they're not wearing a helmet, and I, I explained to them that because you wear a helmet, it makes the sport more dangerous. And so that kind of threw them for a loop. So I explained that when, with a helmet, you're leading with your head first. And in American football, you don't necessarily have to be one-on-one -on -one tackling. You can have five tacklers tackle one play. Well, in rugby, you don't want to commit more than one person to one one ball carrier because that means that there's more space and more people open for them to pass to because the game doesn't stop once you hit the ground with football it does it stops once you go to knee on the ground rugby you'll form what's called a ruck the ball is playing on and now there's space out wide if you committed too many people to that to that area so the sports are very different the other thing is you really get tackled from behind in rugby because there's an offside line and you must be behind it so the contact's always coming from the front of you so you get to see it so those are kind of interesting differences and does keep the sport uh, a lot safer the very first time I was exposed to rugby, I was like, what the hell are they doing? They ain't got no pads. They ain't got no helmet. They don't, they don't got no, uh, no, no leg pads. I'm like, man, these guys are barbaric. <laughs> but, 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 again, once you get into the history of rugby and you, you find that, if you're, especially if you're an American and you watch American football, you'll understand that there's so many things that American football basically created their game off of the rugby game. Uh, in rugby, when you score, it's called a try. You get five points. Uh, but American football, they they it's a touchdown. They they change it to six points. In rugby, you get a conversion. It's two points. Uh, and in, in in American football, it could be a, a one point conversion or a two point conversion. Um, the line of scrimmage is, is is something that came from in rugby. The scrum. Uh, so there's a lot of so many different things uh, uh, that that are similar to uh, American football to rugby that I think is pretty cool once, once you kind of deep dive into it. And in my research as well, if there was no rugby, there would be no basketball, there would be no American football, there would be a lot of, no, a lot of sports wouldn't be created if there wasn't rugby. And I think another interesting thing also is that the, um, at Cal, the American football players were playing rugby at the same time. And this is during when rugby was in the Olympic Games in 1920, 1924. And they went across and represented the USA and won gold in the Olympic Games for rugby. Uh, and these were Cal athletes, uh, football slash rugby players. And, you know, so that's, that's really cool. So we definitely are close, you know, cl have a close bond with, with American football. And what's cool, too, about football these days is that, you know, teams, teams like uh, the Seattle sea, uh, uh, Seahawks and things like that, using rugby-style tackling to improve their defense, um, hiring um, a Samoan uh, rugby player that knows football really well to, to – you know, work on those those attributes of one-on-one -on -one tackling and keeping your head away from the contact and from the knee. I think those things are really cool to see the sport kind of merging even a bit more closer together. Staying with the, the what American football stole from rugby, there's some of the names, some of the positions. You were a guy that played halfback at one point in time. And as I mentioned a second ago, if anyone knows the names, I'm going to mention a second. It's almost like you're walking down a hardware store aisle for the different names. you got a hooker. That you mentioned, you got a prop, you you got you got lock, you got a lock, and you know what I'm saying. You got all these different things that you know that that, that all these different names that are the same. You know, talk about some of those cool names and uh, and talk about why you decided to play halfback. Yeah, so so in the 15 aside game, I'll just briefly give you the positions here for for the listeners there. So you got the forwards and you got the backs. The forwards working around the door at work and they're the most important is in the team and the backs are the pretty boys that gel their hair and you know and and, and drink champagne and that sort of stuff and and, they, and their jerseys and shorts are never dirty but in all, all, all honesty everything is complimentary in the team so your forwards do all the hard work they get you possession of the ball their positions are I mentioned the prop the hooker the two props on the field those are the big sturdy massive units they anchor the scrum they lift in the line out um they're they're, they're the less the less good looking players if you will <laughs> my, my friends will show me the hook as we said we they throw the ball in they hook the ball back the locks are your two tallest players on the on the field because those are the ones that get lifted in the lineup to grab the ball your flankers and eighth man those are the hard players that do a lot of running with the ball a lot of tackling as well then your backline players your halfbacks or your scrum off and fly off those are the two positions i played which is scrum off is the link between the forwards and the backs the fly off is the decision maker the quarterback of the team i enjoyed playing that position because you can have a, a say in what 
what your team wants to do in your strategy and you create a lot of action for, for your, your, your team. The, the rest of the backline players consist of two centers, which are hard running players that no nonsense. Uh, and then you've got your wings, which are your fastest players on the field, like Carl and Isles. They'll burn everybody and score the tries. And the person right at the back is a fullback who's very good at defensive side, can kick and can counterattack as well. So it's a, it's a balanced makeup. So if you look at somebody's body shape and size, without even seeing them run or move, you can probably take a rough guess of what position they could be in rugby. Let me take a time out to tell you about my friends over at Soul Lounge, Houston's premier boutique for the latest fashions. Chinatown Market? Check. BBC? You know they got all that. You know Adidas? Man, they got all of that stuff too. The swag, the footwear, Yeezys, man, they got everything. No Referees Podcast and Soul Lounge has partnered up to bring you a special offer for listening to this episode. Go online to soulloungehtx.com and enter promo code no rules to get 20% off your entire purchase. That's no rules. All one word, all caps. Soul Lounge. Live what you love. Our friend, our friend that connected us, Edmund Allen, uh, in, in Houston, Texas, you know, what kind of player was he, you know, back in the day? He tells me all these stories. You know, what, what position was he in and what kind of player was he? Yeah, so, 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 in, so this is the thing. So in 15s, you can be a certain position, but in sevens, there are, there are only seven people. So there's only three forwards and four backs. And so technically, your positions kind of get morphed in. So he was a hard running player, good, strong tackler. He played in our forwards, you know. Um, and so the, the, the nice thing is that, again, sevens, like once that scrum and that lineup dissipates, which happens very quickly, then everybody's on on attacking or, or running. So the positions, they are less important in the game of sevens. Um, but the thing that, that he had and that we all tried is we need to work on our fitness because the game is so long. In Texas, it's so hot, you know, and the ground is so hard. Uh, so that was definitely an area we all try to focus on was our fitness. And, and literally when the ball's on the other side of the field, you're catching your breath, just waiting. Okay, now it comes back, you got to run again. Um, but again, we had some great moments on and off the field because again, it's all about celebrating afterwards as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. I know there's some stuff at, uh, you know, Nick's place and uh, all these different places out there that y'all used to go celebrate. Uh, I lived in Houston for a few years, so just wanted to make sure that uh, I give our brother a, a quick little shout out. One other thing uh, about the comparisons uh, of rugby and basketball is the jump ball. Um, I know that without uh, without rugby, we would not have the jump ball at the beginning of a basketball game because that's similar in rugby. They do the same kind of movement, correct? Yeah, that's right. So off the kickoffs, uh, so the ball's kicked by, from one team to the other and it's contestable, which means any, anybody can jump up and get the, get the ball as well. And your timing must be perfect. And so you, you, the, firstly, the ball must be kicked 10 meters or beyond. Uh, and so then all of a sudden the team has a chance to jump up and catch it. Now you've got aerial players that are brilliant. There's a lot of basketball players that have transitioned beautifully to rugby that can jump and time that and take it to perfection. If you can't, the nice thing is you can lift a player. So let's say you're a strong base, you could lift me and I can then obviously be higher than anybody that's jumping. So those kind of things come into play as well. Um, but I really, what's fascinating about rugby in America is that you've got so many crossover athletes that play the game where other countries, you know, you kind of focus on your sport a lot earlier at a younger age. So we've had track athletes, um, you know, obviously uh, wrestlers make really good rugby players as well, but kind of all sports transition uh, nicely across. Is that because the, uh, we don't grasp the game so early in the other countries, international countries, outside of America, like we mentioned earlier, kids start playing the game like yourself at 8, 10 years old, whereas here at rugby in America, you're not really playing that game until you're you know, 20s or the late 19, 19, something like that. Yeah, that's right. And so you have then have that 20 years of experience in all the other sports, but some of the skills translate really well. Obviously, football and rugby go really nice in hand, but sprinting. I mean, uh, we had a guy, uh, a funny story, actually. So this guy ran the 100 meters and was about, you know, 10 something, right? So fast. So he gets on the rugby field, very first time playing sevens. Now there's so much space in the sevens field. If you're quick, you can get past almost anyone. So this guy gets the ball. He burns past everybody. I'm the last defender left, and he skins me as well. So he's now beyond the try line. Now, remember, obviously, in football, that would be a touchdown. He didn't have to do anything. But because in rugby, he's standing there just holding the ball upright. I run across and smash him <laughs> over the dead ball line, out of bounds. And he says, what are you doing? And I'm like, 
I'm so sorry. It only counts for the pull down. So while he was fast, he asked to pick up the, 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 the game at the etiquette. And of course, the vision it takes a little while, you know? <laughs> That's hilarious. I can just see you, just a guy standing there celebrating with the ball in his hand, thinking that he, you know, he did something miraculous for his team, scored a big point, and you just smash him like a, like a, like a, like in a movie scene. <laughs> exactly. Folded him like a deck chair. He was upset with me, but then, then he knew. He understood. He's like, okay, my bad. Now I'm gonna put it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Let's let's talk about some of the stuff that you've been involved with after your playing days was over. With, um, you know, you're doing a lot of stuff with the rugby corner. Um, you're, you're commentating uh, sporting events, like you mentioned, all over the world. Um, right now, just as COVID, you, know, you said a lot of stuff that has been canceled. Uh, just talk about the rugby corner. Talk about how you know you started that um, a few, uh, not a few years ago. We started, it, you know, a while ago. You know, tell me about the rugby corner and it has grown over the last years. Yeah, I mean, for me, rugby is a way of life, and it's um, you know, it's it really is a way that you can connect with people from all over the world and have a shared shared common interest. And I think rugby's values are very important. I know that when you're involved in the game itself, you know, you're focused on playing. But once you retire from playing or play socially, it's that interaction that you have with with uh, people from all walks of life. So. After coming across to the U.S., one thing I was involved with for about seven or eight years is youth development, using rugby as a vehicle for social change. And that program is very dear to my heart. And in Los Angeles, we work with, we started with six elementary schools and over the course of seven to eight years ended up, um, you know, in 120 different schools, working with 5,000 kids on an annual basis, young boys and young girls. And the cool thing about bringing rugby to young American kids is that they have no preconceived ideas they will try everything. They love it because everybody gets the ball. There's no quarterback. There's no star. Um, and so those kind of things was great. And um, that I'm going to work on here in Boston as well with the local team here, the New England Free Jacks, a professional rugby side to work with their community. So that's something that I've been passionate about. Um, and then comment, commentary, as you say, broadcasting, to bring the game alive and to share that with everybody around the world using humor in, in my commentary and excitement. That's really the things I, I love, love to, to bring to light have some one-liners here and there. And so, you know, after playing on the Sevens World Series for three years for the USA, I've now got the opportunity to, to travel around the world to commentate on the series. And I also got a chance uh, to fulfill a dream of mine to commentate at the Rugby World Cup. So I was in Japan last year. I got to work with um, a, a guy who incidentally kicked the winning kick for South Africa in 1995 when Nelson Mandela presented the trophy to the Springboks in South Africa, he was the fly uh, Joel Stransky. And so the cool thing about the sport these days being on the broadcasting side is you get to meet brilliant people around the world doing wonderful things, you know? Um, and so I think for the rugby corner, the goal is to give back where we can to the community um, and to, to, to use the sport, as I said, uh, to create opportunities for, for young kids that otherwise might not have that if they didn't play a team sport. That's awesome, man. I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, maybe I should get my son involved in some rugby uh, um, and stuff and things of that nature. You know, talk about when you're going out into these communities and, and you're seeing uh, minority kids and, and kids uh, kids that uh, probably have no idea, never heard of rugby and things of that nature. Um, uh, you're, you're, again, you're a guy from South Africa, multi multicultural, multi-diverse. You know, you're trying to, you know, open these minority communities and kids' eyes open to, uh, to rugby. No, tell me about those experiences and, and what have you seen? Yeah, Everest, my, my first experience was going into, uh, into Los Angeles. Um, I was in, in an area um, that I was the only, uh, you know, white coach going in. And I arrived there and I told the kids, you know, I had a rugby ball with a weird accent. They didn't know what the ball was. They were like, that looks like a fat football. And then I started talking and they were like, you sound weird. And I said, I'm from South Africa. And nobody believed me. They were like, you can't be from South Africa. And I said, why? Why, why is that? They go, because you're white. I go, oh, yeah, there are a lot of white South Africans. But that blew their mind. So then we started to play, um, you know, a couple of fun games. And once the game started, everybody was equal. And I think that's the cool thing about, you know, going into to any community is that there, there's a bond, right, that we all have for, for, for life and for getting, getting, getting on together. And the cool thing about, you know, any game is that it, all of a sudden everybody can relate and smile and have a laugh. And, and, you know, after going there one week, I came the next week, the kids ran to greet me, help me with the bags and the instant bond over the sport and this fun game. And so um, the, the highlight really was bringing these communities together from all over because 
in, in a community, sometimes we're quite isolated and not able to get out and meet people from different walks of life. And what these sports tournaments did on a weekend was bring in uh, schools uh, from, you know, Southeast LA, schools from, you know, uh, Malibu area. So all these kids came together and they played under the same rules of the game, the same shape ball, the same equipment, and they got to hang out with each other in between the games and after to lose a, a game and what's like one game. Those kind of emotional things to help help kids through that at a young age is very important because mental health is such an issue these days as well. And so I really felt that that program, um, it, it's only going in a few pockets in the US, but if we can increase that and, and spread the love of the game all over, um, that could do well for society. Um, you know, because every country has problems and America, we're going through it right now. South Africa went through it as well. And so, you know, if we can bring people together uh, through that, uh, let, let, let's do it, you know? Yeah, that's awesome, man. Hey, I'm a huge rugby fan. Uh, uh, like I said, our, free, our mutual friend, Edmund Allen, uh, uh, it, it really introduced me to the game about uh, 15 years ago. Again, like how you said, you know, remember the first time I met uh, somebody from South Africa I was, that was white? I was like, you ain't from South Africa. You know, it's Africa, you know. So, but once again, once you open your eyes and, and, you do, and you do more research and study, you'll see that, you know, uh, it's a country that's made up all equals, you know. So uh, I appreciate you sharing that story. A couple of quick things before I get you out. Uh, how you said if you're going to be working with the, the local uh, rugby team there, the, the Lumberjacks there, correct? Uh, the Free Jacks. The, the New England Jack. Free Jacks, uh, yes. The, the, the New England Free Jacks. So I just want to ask, uh, how has the pro rugby scene influenced the national team selections and things of that nature? Yeah, so before professional rugby was set up in the U.S., all the, the players that wanted to exceed and excel at the sport had to go overseas. And so that was a tricky and complicated situation for you know any rugby player in the U.S. Do you decide to relocate your family or yourself all the way to to England potentially or to other countries and play and I think that was very challenging while um, your premiership rugby in the UK has a brilliant league and is amazing it, not every player especially a young player coming through has the means and it will be selected for a side there so the fact that we now have you know 13 professional sides in major league rugby in the US and we'd be going for three years well two and a half years with 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 COVID that's fantastic for the sport you know you have all these different big markets that teams have established themselves in that players can now play the national coach for the US Eagles is much easier to select his team now because he can just go across and watch on a weekend watch all these teams play you can watch them online doesn't need to go to all the games as well so I think from a scouting point of view from a selection point of view and a competition point of view because the league also has a lot of international players as well. That also bolsters the strength of the teams. Uh, and so the you know young American college player can play alongside a, a veteran from New Zealand. Um, there was a guy, Ma'a Nanu, playing last year. He won two World Cups with New Zealand, over 100 international games for the most famous rugby team in the world, the All Blacks. And here is a young college kid playing next to him and just gaining that experience, gaining that insight. Um, what's it like to be a professional rugby player on and off the field? And so those things... I think when you talk about when will the U.S. compete with the top 10 nations in the world, I would say we're about seven years away. Give, you know, give professional rugby a full 10 years and then let's compare in the top 15 a side game. That's great, man. Uh, I just love to see the synergy, you know, like, like we mentioned earlier with the, my friend over at USA Water Polo. Uh, you know, it takes some time for these, uh, these professional leagues to grow and then and the national, national teams to kind of have synergy. And I just, see, I, I, I just am happy that that, that it's in it's in place and it's created uh, for down the road. Um, one thing I want to ask, going back to uh, in those inner city communities that you that you have, and, and the kids, you know, they see you and you, they they they, they kind of run up to you, like you said, and they really embrace the rug the rugby game. When they see guys like Perry Baker, or you introduce them to, to guys like Perry Baker, Carla Niles, and they see that there's guys that maybe look like them um, and kind of have come from kind of the same background like them. No, what kind of things are, are, are you sharing with, with those kids, you know, about players that look like them in that sport? That's a very important aspect you touch on there. And so for the, now again, we work with boys and girls, which is great. And so um, a player like Phaedra Knight is in, the, is in the World Rugby Hall of Fame, African-American female rugby player. That's brilliant. Perry Baker, you mentioned outstanding Colin Isles. So we show highlights videos of these players carving it up on the world stage with you know, commentary and crowd going wild. There's 100,000 people watching. So firstly, these kids don't know that rugby's played outside of their school. They see the ball that they play with and we there. So now that they see this game is international, they hear the commentators get so excited and they see uh, Colin Owls and Perry Baker beating everybody. They're like, wow, I want to be like that and I can be like that. And I think that is really exciting to see with more scholarships opening up for rugby around the country, professional rugby, obviously here as well. That is really cool and key to the success. And often when you speak to parents, you know, they want their kids to excel, 
but potentially, you know, a sport like basketball, uh, uh, basketball, baseball, or football, you know, very small percentage will go on and be a professional player. And that's why rugby is really great because there's such a small, small base. So if you're a player that is really excited about it and you have good values as well, and that's the other thing, we encourage these kids to have good values, you want to be a positive attribute to society. So it goes hand in hand. You want to do the sport while well, these values come with it. And they love that as well. So I, th I think we're onto good things as well where they see these role models that look like them on a the world stage, carving it up. And again, that's exciting for all of us when we support America also, you know? Yeah, I appreciate that. Before, uh, before I close, Dallin, can you give the No Referees podcast a quick shout out? Absolutely. You're listening to the No Referees podcast. Keep the change. It's got more steps than the Great Wall of China. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stanford, for coming on our show, sharing some stories about rugby, uh, international stories, their perception of rugby, USA rugby, and the development uh, of the youth in rugby in America. Everyone, please go follow Mr. Stanford on all of his social media pages at the Rugby Corner. That is our friend, friend of the family, Dallas Stanford. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We'll need to get you on the rugby field soon. And I, I think you could be a prop. <laughs> I got the muscles I'm, I'm ready for. <laughs>